Okay, so let's see all your wonderful faces. You have to see mine. I want to see yours. I'm kind of greedy like that. Okay. Um, so tomorrow quiz, 10 points over upper respiratory. Okay, we'll do that at eight o'clock and then we'll go right into SIM. And I have several stations gonna be set up for you guys for SIM. So hopefully you'll really enjoy it. It's, oh, here we go, there's another one. Okay, and then- Becky, is there anything we should look at to like prepare for SIM or just like the knowledge that we have and stuff? I hope you have some knowledge. Um, well, let's face it, you're gonna have to do chest compressions. So we'll talk about ACLS a little bit before um, we get into the SIM, but really you're gonna be looking at EKG strips. You're going to have to diagnose what's going on with the patient. So it's basic knowledge. Um, we'll talk a little bit about ACLS and CPR, especially in the hospital, because you know you guys are used to, what do we, you do, um, you're supposed to do like 120 um, reps a minute. They say 100, but like the sweet spot is between 120 and 140. And then you stop and then two breaths, right? Well, we don't do that in the hospital. Acute care, we do CPR until the cows come home. Um, so one of the things is we're going to have little mannequins that if you're doing good compressions, it's going to be green. And you're going to have to do it for three minutes. So we're going to see what kind of shape you guys are in because that's how long we do it in the hospital for three minutes. Um, so that kind of stuff we'll talk about tomorrow, but you're gonna kill your patient because it's no fun if you save them right away. So we're gonna kill them and then we're gonna bring them back. So, but we'll talk about it tomorrow. There's nothing, there's no homework for it or anything like that, okay? And if I giggle a couple of times, don't be offended. I'm giggling with you. Okay. Are we good? We ready to get this this war and peace over with? Because it's a lot of stuff. Um, it is a lot of stuff, but some of the questions we were talking about in clinical today are just simple qu questions with one word answers but I wanted you to be familiar with that kind of stuff. Okay, y'all ready for this? Okay, what is bronchitis? Inflammatory response of bronchial tissue that causes capillary dilation and edema of mucosal lining leading to exudate formation. So it's a lot of fluid, right? A lot of junk in the lungs, correct? Okay, um, what are some signs and symptoms? Cough, chest pain, fever, and malaise. Now, how do we, that sounds like it could be a bunch of stuff, doesn't it? So how do we diagnose it? So you have to rule out pneumonia first. Yeah. So if you go into the doctor's office, they're going to look at you and they're going to say, yep, you're coughing. Let's get a chest x-ray. If the chest x-ray does not look like pneumonia, then they're going to diagnose you as bronchitis is ge the general gist of it. And how do we treat the bronchitis? Broad spectrum antibiotics. Yeah. So what's a broad spectrum antibiotic? Rocephin? Yeah, Rocephin's a good uh, broad spectrum. Rocephin's good, and then if they're in the hospital, we generally do um, Zosin as a broad spectrum. Um, what are some nursing interventions for bronchitis? What would we like, tell our patients? What would we do for our patients? Increase their fluid intake. Right, but you know what? It's, it's kind of hard to increase their fluid intake, right? Especially when they're coughing all the time. So do we, so what can we emphasize with that fluid intake? 
Like, how are we going to get them to drink more fluid? Should they drink a gallon in two in an hour? Well, a good rule of thumb is every time they cough, they should take a sip of water. They're not going to be able to drink a lot because they're coughing so bad. But every time they cough, if they drink, then they're going to be able to get more down their system. What about when they're in bed? Should they be laying flat? No. 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 They should be sitting up, huh? Get some of that, what we call um, pulmonary toileting. Let the lungs, let the fluid flow down to the base of the lungs. Um, so if that was bronchitis, then what the heck is pneumonia? Inflammation of lung parenchyma, which is the bronchioles and alveoli. Okay. Now, what are some non-infectious ways we get pneumonia? Aspiration, Aspiration of gastric contents, inhalation of toxins and gases. Okay. So they talk about gastric contents. How does that make you have pneumonia? What do you think? Is it because you're like breathing in because it's like acidic? So it is acidic and what happens is it irritates the lungs and what happens when you get something irritated? They become inflamed and when they become inflamed what are they going to start doing? They're going to start giving exudate right? Because that's what the inflammatory process. So that's why when they say gastric contents that's what's happening. Now I'm like, am I getting so patients that are on um, proton pump inhibitors and H2 receptor blockers are really at risk for getting aspiration pneumonia because they don't feel because they don't have that acidy taste. They don't they don't know to like swallow it back down and it can easily get into their lungs. Um, so we talked about aspiration. What else was there? Inhalation of toxins. Yeah. What do you think that means? Smoking. Smoking could do it. Gas. Gas. All of it is inflammatory response. Um, you're working at a print shop. How about you're working at a nail salon? Man, I need a pedicure bad, right? So that smelling all that um, stuff, all the gels and everything could cause an inflammatory response too. So would like inhalation of like pollution, like in cities and stuff, would that lead to it too? For some people, yeah, it could very much so. If you're talking about a place like LA, um, Pittsburgh, where you're talking about in a valley, very much so it could cause it. Is there another one? I thought there was three. Maybe I'm having a brain fart. I could be having a brain fart. It was fart. gases, but oh. you included it in the last thing. Oh, okay. Um, what are the three classifications of pneumonia? Community acquired um, the HAP, VAP, and HCAP, and then opportunistic. Okay. So community acquired means that you get it from the community, right? Bacterial, viral, you get it out, you're at home and you decide to go, I don't know, roller skating, and you get it from the community. HAP is hospital acquired pneumonia, VAP is ventilator acquired pneumonia. And then HCAP is hospital blood. I forget what the C is, but it's hospital acquired pneumonia also. That means that we, we particularly didn't do it, but we didn't do our job. 
So we didn't get that patient up and cough and deep breathing. We didn't make sure that they didn't have, um, they had their teeth brushed in the morning and at night, at least in the morning and at night. Should have it more often because they're in the hospital, but um, we didn't use, we didn't get them up in the bed, you know, into the chair. We didn't walk them. So it's something that we did per se. We didn't do our job and they got hospital acquired pneumonia. Um, and then also ventilator. And it's really important because if they get a hospital acquired pneumonia, ventilator acquired pneumonia, the hospital does not get paid. So if the patient has to sit there for another six days, that's all in the hospital. So that's why it's really important that we make sure that a patient doesn't get hospital acquired pneumonia. That is including though, a patient that aspirated on, maybe they came in with a stroke and then they had an aspiration. That's still on us because we should put the mechanisms in place so that patient doesn't aspirate, okay? So whenever, whenever you're talking about, um, oh, I'm trying to think what I'm trying to think of, um, reimbursement. You know, it's really important that our patients don't get that hospital acquired pneumonia. Now, opportunistic means that the body's, body's immune system's down and that bacteria that's already in the body that or that normally wouldn't become pneumonia is able to overcome the body and become pneumonia. A lot of times we're looking at pa patients that are having um, immune deficiencies, HIV, lupus, um, chronic steroid use things like that. Okay, um, what are the manifestations of pneumonia in the elderly? Reduced cough and sputum production, and then they'll have fever, tachypnea, and decreased level of consciousness. Right, they don't, they, generally don't come to you and say, I'm having, I'm coughing real bad or anything like that. Their cough reflux is a little bit lacking, should we say. Um, so we have to really take consideration. We also have to do with that level of consciousness, you know, or even some, anything that's altered. You know, we always think of UTIs, but we really have to look at pneumonia also. What are the complications of pneumonia? Anybody? Anybody? Extension of infection into the pleural, uh, the act to the, the lung collapse thing. I can't say that word. Um, pleural, yes. Pleural effusion, lung abscess, pericarditis, and sepsis, and the MP, MP, emo, the ball of pus. Yeah, the big ball of pus. Okay, so what is allolectasis? Collapse lung. Nothing to do. Yeah, the lungs collapse. Yeah, it it when I think of lung collapse, I think of pneumothorax, but this lung, the reason it's basically collapses because the there's fluid filled and that makes it collapse. So how do we stop it? The same thing to stop any pneumonia. When we're gonna make sure they cough and deep breathe and do the incentive barometer and everything like that. What about empyema? I just love that word, empyema. Accumulation of purulent exudate within the pleural space. Yeah. So what happens is we'll see um, like a shadow on a on a the chest X-ray, and this pus, it it the bacteria grows and grows and it has a pus. Then it walls itself off. So if somebody has an empyema, what we generally do is do a um, antibiotics for so long, usually it's, it's like 10 days to hopefully shrink that empyema and then we take it out. Um, if somebody would go in, if they would go in and say, oh, there's an empyema, let's go get it. And it, it kind of reminds me of, you know, um, a spider egg. You know, if you go into a spider eggs, all the little spiders go everywhere. Well, when you're talking about empyema, what could happen is when they puncture that um, pus sac, where's the pus go, but all over the lung base. Okay, so that's why they like to do antibiotics first, 
let it hopefully shrink it a little bit and then they'll go in for it. Um, there was a, a uh, he was a prisoner and he was at another hospital, another local hospital, not related to SSM, but um, they went in and they did a bronch to wonder why he had pneumonia. They did a bronch and they um, nicked the empyema and the patient um, became septic and died from it. So that's why they're very careful whenever they go in and do anything with an empyema. Isn't that kind of a gross thing though? The spider and just everywhere, pus everywhere. Um, what is the difference between pleural effusion and empyema? The pleural effusion is like fluids and the empyema is pus. Yep, that's it. And how do we, well, I told you how we fix empyemas. Gosh, I gotta shut my mouth. What are some signs and symptoms of Legionnaire's disease? Dry cough, dyspnea, malaise, chills, fever, headache, confusion, anorexia, diarrhea, myalgia, arthralgias. Okay, so how, ugh. Um, so how is Legionnaire's disease may, done? Or I don't want to say done, but how does it happen? Isn't it from like contaminated water? Right. So, uh, well, it's from the American Legion. There was a, a big convention and all these people started getting sick um, and dying. And of course they were American Legions, hence the Legionnaires. And they went and they found that it was a, uh, it was a air conditioning unit that was dripping. And from that dripping, the bacteria grew. And then guess what happens? The spores go up into the air conditioning and it spouted off all over the, um, the hotel. Um, we can still have that in Southern Illinois, which we do. We get our patients with um, Legionnaires. Usually it's smaller houses like trailers and they have the little window units and they'll run the little, and then of course they have the tray underneath so it doesn't leak or they have the tray just holding up the window unit and that gets the bacteria and then it goes into their air conditioning unit and it gets into their built in their building. Um, so we do have, we do get Legionnaires. I don't remember getting any this year. It's usually like early spring that we ended up getting them. Um, but which I thought was kind of cool that we, we still get Legionnaires. Um, think about little things. Um, you know, those waterfalls that they buy, you can buy for your desk, you know, and the water goes and it recycles and goes through. You can get them at Walmart, I guess, for like 10 bucks. That is a, for, a, a source for Legionnaires because you're using that same bacteria and it's going over and over and over again. Eventually um, the bacteria can grow. What kind of isolation is Legionnaire's disease or Legionnaire's patients? Um, what kind of isolation are they on? Airborne? Anybody else? Nothing. Yeah. Um, Legionnaires, it's nothing. They're not contagious. Okay. Their bacteria, the bacteria that got them where they're at is contagious, but where they themselves are not contagious. Okay, why is mycoplasma pneumonia called walking pneumonia? Signs and symptoms are mild. Yeah, the symptoms are mild. And also, it's very easy to get. It's very easy to get. I mean, that's why when you're talking about recruits, you know, army, you know, they're all in the same bunkhouse. That basically can, that um, pneumonia can basically walk to the next person, so to speak. But generally it's due to the fact that it's mild and you're able to walk. Um, what are some risk factors for aspiration pneumonia? Depressed cough and gag reflex. Okay. That's the biggest one, right? So who's it, who's at risk for having aspiration pneumonia?
Seizures. Okay. Seizures. People who had a stroke. Altered consciousness. Altered consciousness, like what? People who've had a stroke. Yep, people that had strokes. People coming back from surgery. People coming back from surgery. What about, what else about surgery could get you aspiration pneumonia? Being animated. Anesthesia. Well, anesthesia, because especially if you're like, I don't know, I pick on Cracker Barrel, but I'll do it again. Especially if you're like at Cracker Barrel and you had your turkey dinner and then all of a sudden you had a gallbladder attack and they decided to take your gallbladder out right away, right? And you just finished with turkey. They go to intubate you. You have all that stuff in your stomach that can easily come up and go into your lungs. So any, any kind of emergent surgery. What about OB surgery? Gynae surgery. Why would that cause you to possibly have aspiration pneumonia? Any OBers that had OB? Well, like hysterectomies and that stuff, they put you basically on your head. I mean, you're upside down. Um, when when uh, patients come back from their hysterectomies, they look rough looking. They're real rough because they're all um, swollen from being on their head for so long. So we have an altered level of consciousness, seizures. What else? Elderly? Enteral nutrition. What was that? Enteral oh, nutrition. Yes, definitely. What kind? We're talking about that. Like would a peg tube possibly be a risk factor? Yes. Could be. Which one do you think is a bigger risk? An NG tube or a peg tube? NG. Why? Because it can, it's like a direct, like it's going down your esophagus. So it can come back up that way. Right. Well, because when you go down your esophagus, you're keeping your um, gastric sphincter open. So it's very easily it can come back up. So anybody that's on tube feeding, NG tube feeding is a high risk. For. That's why you don't, you turn off the, your tube feeding, wait a half an hour, then if you have to roll your patient or reposition, you do it then. Okay, don't say, oh, it's going to be just a minute. Well, that minute can actually kill your patient. And don't they have to be at like 45 degrees or 30 degrees at all time or is that a vodka thing? Nope, that should be it. They should, they should have elevation. Okay. Um, how do we diagnose pneumonia? Chest x-ray. Yep, chest x-ray. We'll roll it out. Um, patients will come in saying they're having chest pain. Well, guess what? The chest pain most likely will be because of the fact that they are um, coughing so much. So we'll do, you know, of course, the EKG and the, all the labs and then chest x-ray. How do we get a sputum sample? This is going back a little bit. We ask them to cough up the mucus and then we can get it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <spit> it out. <laughs> it's pretty disgusting. Yeah. So when's a good time to get it? First thing in the morning. Yes. Um, first thing in the morning, should they have their breakfast? So before they cough up their sputum sample? No. No, they should not. Unless you want bacon bits and bacon and egg in your sputum, which would be really disgusting. It's very hard to get a sputum. And I believe I told you before that if you wait to get your sputum before you start antibiotics, then you'll probably, your patient could possibly die before you get them. NCLEX world, we do our antibiotics, we uh, get our sputum sample before we start our antibiotics. What kind of medications do we give patients with pneumonia? Uh, before we get the results, we give broad spectrum. Okay, broad spectrum. And then after that, we do it based on the gram scene. Yeah. What else can we give them? 
Bronchodilators, mucolytics, and expectorants. Okay. What does mucolytics do? Thins. And the mucus. What was that? Thins mucus. Yes. It cuts that bond. So then what's the expectorants do? Helps them cough it out. Okay. Should we give them some cough syrup to no their cough? No, we want them to cough. What happens? What would you be against a patient that's been coughing all day, can't get any sleep, and they take it at night? What do you think? Yeah, that would be yes. So they can get some sleep. What about a patient? And Jen, you're right. We generally do not give cost suppressants, but I'm thinking of scenarios of where we, we might. Um, what about a patient that just came back and they maybe they had, oh, well, what the hell, we're in cardiology. Say they have, um, we, they just ha can't, had a cabbage and now they have pneumonia. Would we want to give them cough medicine? Yes. Cough Why? Because if they cough too hard, they can um, pop a stitch or rupture. Exactly. So there's two cases where it makes good for maybe we would, you know, not not like scheduled every four hours or anything like that, but give them some time to heal. Um, especially if they're coughing all day and they can't get any sleep, we'll give them a little bit of cough syrup just so they can sleep. Um, what are some interventions for patients with pneumonia? Increased oxygen, oxygen and fluids. Increase oxygen and fluids. Incentive spirometer. Yep, incentive spirometer. The chest physiotherapy. Yes. What is chest physiotherapy? The vest that beats the patient. It can beat the patient or it can do old school and do cupping um, on their back. Is there anything else we could do? Turn cough, deep breathe. Throat drainage. Postural drainage, turn cough and deep breathe. Patient teaching. Patient teaching. What are we going to teach them? Quit smoking. Um, get adequate nutrition. Good. Maintain fluid. Maintain fluid intake for sure. Make sure they know how to use the incentive spirometer and how often to be using yeah, it. Yeah, that's a good one too. Instead of just putting the, the machine on their bedside table, make sure that they do know how to do it. And don't forget, going back to the basics, to brush their teeth. Okay. We definitely want them to brush their teeth because that bacteria is just going to march right on down. Okay. How is TB spread? Droplet nuclei. Yeah. So TB itself is small enough that it actually can go through your N95 mask. Okay. N95 is, means that 95% of all the bacteria cannot get through the mask, right? It is smaller than the smallest holes in your N, holes in your N95 mask. So that being said, we just give you a 995 mask and have you go into a TB patient's room. How, why do you think you are protected just with that N95 mask? The negative air pressure. No. And I find this really interesting and I hate microbiology, but I found this really interesting. So it's only spread if it's on moist. Ah, there you go. So it can only be spread on in droplets. Okay, so those droplets that it attaches to can't get through the N95 mask. TB in itself, the bacteria itself can get through it, but it can't even, it's not, it can't even live enough um, to get through that N95 mask without that moisture. Okay, 
So Becky, are they on droplet precautions then or airborne precautions? They're on airborne. Okay then. So when we go, so what's droplet precautions? What do we do when we're on droplet? N95 in the gown, glove, mask. Yeah. Uh, goggles. And not really even, not even um, N95. Any well, back in the day, now everybody's on co on N95. But back in the day, whenever you had like a flu or anything, you would have just a regular surgical mask gown and gloves okay um where was i going with that gown and gloves when you're talking about tb what what do you what do you use when you go into the patient's room um you don't want to have goggles right do you i mean if it gets in your eyes that's a moist mucus membrane but it's airborne precautions right so technically when you go into a patient's room with tb all you need is your n95 mask if you touch them then you'll need gloves so if you perform a bath um you generally do use standard precautions um what about taking the tray out of the patient's room should you depose, dispose of the contents right there in the room? No. What do you do? What do you do with that tray? The truck is gone. You're too late. What are you gonna do with that patient's tray? Dirty utility. <laughs> you put it in- Would you have to bag it? No, Normal. You, no, you don't have to bag it. Once it hits, um, once it hits solid, so once it hits like, uh, like the tray, say the patient coughed on the tray, it dies very quickly on that tray. So it doesn't, it's not like C. diff. If, you know, C. diff is alive for six months. So if you have a patient that has C. diff and say the family was in there touching everything without gloves, cause you know how family O's are. I won't get C. diff from them. I live with them, but they touch and maybe the patient wiped his butt, his butt and put it on the, on the, um, the side rails. And then that family member touched that side rails. It is very easy for that family member to walk out and use the handrails and pray, put C. diff spores all the way down those handrails. Without washing them with bleach, those C. diff spores can stay up for six months. Okay, that's a long darn time. And what will happen? Here comes little Emily coming through and she touches that same spot. Then she goes down to the cafeteria and she gets herself a hamburger. And some ketchup drips on her finger. And then she takes that finger and she, she just ate that guy's poo that had C. diff. Yum. But the good thing is Emily has an immune system and probably stop that C. diff from going anywhere. But just the thought of you touching that guy's feces and then eating it is kind of disgusting. But that's, that's what happens. Okay, that's why we want those patients, family members to be, um, to gown up and glove up. It's not to protect so much them from this, that patient, but it's to protect everybody else. When we're talking about TB, TB dies really quick. So all we used to, oh gosh, and this is in the new hospital. So the new hospital, what came around, I wanna say 13, I think 2013. So this was at the new hospital. When we went to a TB patient's room, we would have gowns, gloves, mask, everything. We would put their um, trays in ice, in bags, and carry the bags out, which really made no sense because we put the bags, the trays in the bags that were in the room. And then they came around and said, you guys don't have to do all that. You know, all we need is the N95 and gloves if we're gonna give perform anything on standard precautions if we're gonna do anything on that patient. So um, let's see, let's move on. What's cessation necrosis? 
So when the dead tissue inside the tubercule forms a cheese-like center. Yeah, that's good. That's something nice, gummy, right? Cheese-like center. Uh, what are the manifestations of TB? Fatigue, weight loss, night sweats, anorexia, and a low-grade fever in the afternoon. Yes, very much so. So everybody that gets admitted to the hospital, we go through those same questions every single time. Now with COVID, we threw in some, have you traveled outside? Have you been around anybody with COVID or anything like that? But every time somebody comes in, we ask them um, those TB questions. Especially the night sweats is a very indicative of TB. Hypnoptosis, um, we used to, I don't think we do as much anymore, but if somebody came in and they had hypnoptosis, they would automatically go into a negative pressure room. Um, how do we screen for TB? The intradermal PPD or yeah. the two-step yeah. procedure. So who gets one-step procedures? Anybody know? Is it like healthy, normal people? Yeah, the healthy, normal people get usually one, one step. And then who gets two-step? At risk. Yeah, who's at risk? Long-term care residents and workers, they also test. Yeah, I don't know, you guys that work in long-term care, when's the last time you dealt with a TB patient in long-term care? I, I haven't come across one. I don't work in long-term care, but I haven't come across one. Anyone when there's, when there's um, densely populated, okay? That's who really is at risk. So homeless people, they're at risk because although they're on their own, they're kind of go into their, they kind of huddle together in their little, I don't want to, settlements. Um, prisoners. I think the last couple, oh, out of all their TB patients, I would say three of them were prisoners. So um, we just have to look. If they have hypnopticists and they come from a high, um, highly, at risk group, we definitely want to do the two step. Um, what is considered a negative response of that one step? If it measures less than five millimeters. Yep, that's it. So if you don't get a basically a response, we can say that they're negative. Um, no, we that's, do what? That's 0. 0.5, right? 0. 0.5 millimeters? Yes, it's small. Okay, so what medication would we use for a single drug therapy? Isoniazid. Okay. What medications would we use for the multi-drug therapies? And you Isoniazid, rifampin, uh, pyrazinamide, and ethamputol. You did that pretty good. The biggest one that we usually see is the rifampin. And what is some patient teaching for rifampin? Your body fluids will turn red orange. So if a patient comes to you and they're on rifampin, maybe they've been on there for like three months and they come to you and they, they said, I don't know, but my, 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 the whites of my eyes are kind of yellowish. What's your response? Do they wear contacts? Well, it's normal. Is that normal? Yellow? Orange. Yellow is jaundice. Or ah. Red orange. Yeah, red orange is what we're looking for. But if they come to you yellow, then they're jaundice. And what does jaundice mean? Liver issues. Oh, right. And why is that particularly um, worry someone, people on rifampin? Isn't, aren't they at like a higher risk for liver toxicity? Right. So it is metabolized in the liver. So before we even start them on any of these medications, what are we going to do? Check their liver function. Yep. We're going to check their liver function. Okay. So 
The sclera, when it's sclera is yellow, that's liver damage. If it's orange, reddish orange, then that's the rifampin. But we need to know the difference. Okay. If a patient comes to you and says, you know, or they're saying, you know, I'm, I look a little bit yellowish, then we have to look at it and look at, let's do some labs on their liver to see if they're able to handle that rifampin. Um, red orange more does issues to like your like pee and fume and things like that. It wouldn't like really affect your skin, would it? The rifampin? Yeah. Yeah. It's just your, um, your body fluids. Um, why is compliance difficult with patients with TB? They're on it for a long period of time. Yeah. And why does that, why is that difficult? They have to take it every day. And if you're talking about a homeless person, how's that going to work? Do you think they're, you can trust them to take it every day? No, so what are you gonna do? Just give it to the soup kitchen. Yeah, people have to eat. So if you tag that, um, work with a soup kitchen, work with, you know, a homeless shelter, maybe, hopefully we can get that, you know, medication to them daily. I mean, let's face it, it's hard to keep, we can't even get people to take antibiotics for 10 days. Imagine six months. Um, let's see. So we did, okay. So we talked about the blood test before any TB medication. We talked about the complications of TB medications. Um, we talked about the precautions before we go into a TB room. Um, we talked about the type, boy, I'm just knocking these suckers out, aren't I? I'm not even. So I'm Becky, I, the only question I have is for like number 35. So uh, I, you kept saying like standard precautions, but then airborne precautions. So which is it? So standard precautions, when I think of standard precautions, I think of gloves. Like when you go in, you're going to be in gloves. When I, but when you're talking about TB patient, all you need is that N95 mask. And that's it. So N95 mask and your gloves. So if you're going into the patient's room and you were just opening pills, well, that's not a bad, that's a bad example. Maybe you're bringing them water. You won't need gloves. But if you do patient care on the patient, then you're gonna use gloves. Does that make sense? but you're still gonna have your N95 mask. You don't need to gown up and glove up and goggles and everything like that. And so if, say you walk, even walked in with your, your pills, well, your medications, you would walk in and you won't need gloves until you start you know, messing with the patient and start um, opening your packages. That's why I meant by standard precautions, because generally we don't do anything. When we walk into a patient's room, we don't wear gloves into the patient's room. But when we start giving them a bath and um, doing IV fluids and the sub Qs and all that, that's when we have gloves. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, what should the patient wear when they're leaving the room? Mask. Yep, that's it. Just a plain old surgical mask. Okay, how are we doing? Oh, you guys are giving me blank spaces. Amber's were looking scary. Okay. What are some risk factors for lung cancer? Increased age, genetic predispositions, exposure to tobacco smoke and other carcinogens, radiation exposure, inhaled irritants such as asbestos. About 45 minutes. Very good. Um, so anything that causes continuous, I would say continuous inflammation in your lungs, right? 
Um, what is the most aggressive form of lung cancer? Small cell. Yeah, small cell. One of my friends in Pittsburgh ended up with small cell cancer, and it's just, oh, gosh. Uh, which lung cancers have early metastasis? Large cell. Yep, large cell. Um, and I think what I want what I want you to know is that when you're talking about metastasis, it's the same cancer. It just goes into a different area. So, and that's why we say metastasis. Um, I think when I first started on the oncology floor, I kind of thought that whenever it metastasized, it was like a different kinds of cancer. Maybe it like changed its genetic component, but no, it's the same cancer. Okay, it just goes to different areas. And depending on what kind of the primary cancer, that's pretty much what determines where it would metastasize. Like lung cancer, it usually goes into, it can go to liver, to kidneys. Um, lung cancer is also very indicative of going into bones. When you're talking about prostate cancer, you're talking about kidney cancer. So everything has its little, I don't know, like map, roadmap of how it's going to go. Um, what are some manifestations of lung cancer? Chronic cough, wheezing, shortness of breath, uh, hemoptysis, dull aching, chest, pleuritic pain, hoarseness, dysphagia, weight loss, anorexia, fatigue, weakness, bone pain, endocrine, and neuromuscular cardio, like all the symptoms that come from where it metastasized to. There's all kinds of different things, right? And a lot of things that you just said, we can pass off to something else, right? We can say, well, it's because I have COVID or it's because I um, have a cold or allergies or anything like that. That's why a lot of times we see patients that come, you know, um, when it's more advanced. It's gonna be interesting with this COVID and some of these patients that have been intubated for weeks, you know, further down the line, if they're gonna end up with lung cancer because inflammation, a constant inflammation of the lungs really can end up causing, it, it, it ends up making the cells mutate and into a cancer cell. So it should be interesting and sad. Um, how do we diagnose lung cancer? Chest x-rays, sputums, uh, sample cytology exam, bronchoscopy, lung biopsy. Okay, so how do we do a percutaneous lung biopsy? Stick a needle through the chest wall. It's usually through the back. Okay, it's usually, we, they usually like to do it in the back. Um, what is a complication for lung biopsy? Pneumothorax, hemotysis, air embolism, seeding of the biopsy tract, and death. Death. Okay, so what are we going to look for? So if a patient comes back to you and they had a lung biopsy, what kinds of signs and symptoms are we looking for for any complications? Dyspnea, decrease SpO2. Yes, so dyspnea, tachypnea, tachycardic, um, decrease SpO2, maybe on the... Uh, on, if, on the affected side, you would have a decrease in lung sounds. Um, generally, what you'll see is it'll be a little square where they put the needle in, and you might see some serosanguis fluid, but you shouldn't see like bright red or anything like that. It's usually a pinpoint if they have um, any, any uh, drainage from that site. Um, what is a transbronchial lung biopsy? How do we do that? Is 
So how do you think we do a transbronchial lung biopsy? With the bronchoscopy? Yes, it will be part of the bronch. It's just a funny way to say bronch. So what would be some patient teaching before a transbronchial lung biopsy? NPO for eight hours. Yes. What about what medications would we tell them to hold that they shouldn't have? What do you think? I'm thinking cough suppressants maybe, but I'm not sure. That they can what? have cough suppressants? I don't know, I'm taking a shot in the dark. <laughs> well, we're putting a huge ass needle. Oh, I said ass. Yeah, it's taped. Huge butt needle into the back of their of their, through their back into their lung. So what could be a complication of that? Bleeding. So what medications do you think we're gonna tell them to hold five days prior to getting this done? Anticoagulants. Anticoagulants. What about antiplatelets? Nah. <laughs> Actually, yeah, we tell them the whole day antiplatelets also. Of course. Of course. <laughs> um, what about, what other medications should they not take before this procedure? You don't use contrast dye in this, do you? No. Okay, never mind. Would you hold like diabetic medication? Yes, diabetic medications would be good. And then just the off-brand, like if they're having Lasix or um, laxatives, you probably want them to hold that too. Okay, remember these, when they go down, it's just like going for your TEE. They're gonna be consciously sedated. So what they're gonna do is they're gonna give basically a paralytic for the, around the throat. So the patient doesn't gag. So what do you think is gonna happen when they come back to the floor? How are we gonna make sure that they have that gag reflex? Tongue depressor? Yes, tongue depressor. Very good, very good, very good. So okay. going back to the medications, will we hold all of those five days before? No, we would just hold the um, anticoagulants and the uh, antiplatelets. Okay, thank you. Prior. But everything else they can have. So are the other ones like 24 hours in advance? Oh, it could be right before. So if they, I mean, if they take Lasix the next, the morning before, that's fine. We just don't want it to take it that morning. Um, another thing is NSAIDs. Um, NSAIDs and fish oil are medications that we, they generally have you hold if there's a risk for bleeding. Would you what? do it? If they have like bronchodilators or does that make a difference? You probably want them to take the bronchodilator because the one thing we don't want them to do is bronchospasm. Um, that's a complication of a bronch is a bronchospasm. That's why whenever we do a bronch, uh, generally there's an anesthesiologist there. So if we have to rapidly intubate, we can. Why fish oil? Why fish oil? Because it thins your blood also. Um, post-op teaching, do you think if we do a biopsy, what do you think a, I don't want to, it's not a complication, but what do we expect, do you think? Pain. Pain? They will, they'll have a little bit, not much. What else do you think? We just went in there and cut a piece. Hard time breathing. What was that? Will they have a hard time breathing? 
they shouldn't. If they have a hard time breathing, we're gonna we're gonna fix that. We just Did you had, need to monitor for infection? I'm thinking a little bit more um, quickly than that. If you take a biopsy, a part of their lung out, a piece of their lung, what like do you think is going to happen? Pink sputum? Yes. So they'll have some pink tin sputum. If they do have pink tin sputum, we're just going to let them know. Okay. We're not expecting them to have globs of, you know, blood clots coming out of their mouth, but a little bit of pink tin sputum is expected. And we already did about how to, to check for swallowing. What's a thoracotomy? Surgery where they open the chest and make an incision in the chest wall between your ribs. That's exactly, the lungs. That is exactly it. What is a VAT? Video assisted thora something surgery. <laughs> thoracotomy. Yeah, so hopefully if you get a VAT, you, the incision is not as large. They don't have to like crack your ribs open or anything like that. That's why VAT is a lot better. Um, let's go back to pneumonia. What interventions will you employ to ensure the thoracotomy patient does not develop pneumonia? Turn, cop, deep, breathe, ambulate early, incentive spirometer. Definitely, all those. What about pain medicine? Should we knock them out so they don't complain anymore? Uh-uh. Why? Because you want them to be up and like aware and coughing. Yes. So that's when the, that pain tolerance level is, we look at, you know, what's your functional pain tolerance? And that's what we want to go to. If they say their pain tolerance is a zero, we need to do some education, okay? Um, and let's not forget about the toothbrushing. We can also use chlorhexidine. So when a patient has um, a VAT, we'll, a lot of times you'll see, or let's just say thoracotomy, we'll um, do mouthwash, chlorhexidine mouthwash also. Okay, what's pleuritis? Inflammation of the pleura. Okay, so is that infection? No, an inflammation. Okay, so what would we give this patient that had inflammation of their, of their pleura? Analgesics. Okay. Um, huh? Go ahead. NSAIDs. NSAIDs. And what happens if that NSAIDs and analgesics isn't helping any? What do you think? What's our next step? Um, uh, steroids. Yep, steroids. Um, could we give these folks cough suppressants? Yes. Yes. Yeah. It hurts, guys. It hurts. So if it hurts so much every time they take a breath, it hurts because that pleura is supposed to just nice and glide and it's not gliding. So every time they take a breath, it hurts. So what do you think your assessment is going to be like? What do you think you're going to hear? Pleural friction rub. Pleural friction rub. Diminished breath sounds. Yes. Remember, it hurts to breathe. So they're not going to take nice deep breaths for you. And you might as well just forget telling them to take a deep breath and cough. It's going to hurt. So you're going to hear, you can be able to hear that plural rub, but at the same time, it's going to be diminished because they can't take those deep breaths. Any other manifestations we're going to see or hear? Rapid, uh, oh, you said here. Or, or C, whatever. Rapid, shallow respirations. Yes, rapid, shallow respirations. Because even though they can't deep breathe, their body still needs that oxygenation. So it's going to turn around. And since they can't deep breathe, it's gonna, they're going to um, breathe more. 
more often. Did that start like hyperventilation and then them go into like all that stuff? Yeah, you could. Very much so. Um, okay, so we did signs and symptoms. We did how do you treat it? Is there any other kind of nursing interventions we can give for patients with pleuritis? Position and splint the chest wall while they're coughing. Yes. Positioning and splinting the chest wall. Okay. What about a pleural effusion? What's some signs and symptoms of a pleural effusion? Dyspnea, pain, diminished breath sounds, dull oh. Percussion tone over affected area. Very good. So what are we going to do? How are we going to treat those? Thoracentesis. Yeah, a thoracentesis. Um, are we going to give them antibiotics or anything like that? Yes, because you're going to want to prevent it from like the fluid accumulating all over again. Yeah. Well, we, we definitely, uh, because of the fact that they're in pain, the last thing we want to do is because they can't turn, cough, deep breathe, or do incentive spirometer, we're going to, we can do prophylactic antibiotics so it doesn't get worse into pneumonia and go with septic. Um, pneumothorax, these are cool. Did anybody watch the video? Do I have the GOAT video up? Did you guys see the GOAT video? Nobody saw the goat. Maybe I don't have it up. Well, we're going to watch the goat video tomorrow, man. It really explains pneumothorax. But anyway, actually, it explains attention pneumothorax. So what is it? Pneumo I do have it, it on there. Mm -hmm. Nobody watched it yet? <gasps> <laughs> well, she ratted you all out. <laughs> Is it the one where they are um, like bagging a set of goat lungs? Yeah, that's it. It's a oh, where they're pushing it in and out. Yeah, that's a goat video. Okay, so you guys did watch it. That is perfect for uh, tension pneumo. It explains it to a T. It's now granted, I'm not very happy that they killed a goat to show us how about attention pneumo. That's my vegetarianism makes me want to gag, but it was kind of cool. I guess I'm not a very good vegetarian if I make you guys watch it, but you, I'm sure you're not going to turn me into the vegetarian organization. So what is a pneumothorax? Accumulation of air in the plural space. Okay, so it's an accumulation of air in a pleural space. What are the two cl classifications of pneumothorax? Spontaneous and traumatic. Okay, so spontaneous, there's a bleb. What's a bleb? Collection of air between the lung and outer surface of the lung. Is that what a bleb is though? Mm -hmm. It's a lesion-like thing that can pop. Yeah, I kind of think of a pimple in the lung, except it doesn't have pus. But what happens is that little bleb, it's a, um, a lesion, a growth. I like to think of it as a growth. And it pops. And when it pops, it can cause a pneumothorax. For the, I think of it as like a balloon. Like whenever you first get a balloon, you can stretch it out, right? But if you blow it into it, what happens, it gets all moist in there. And then if you try to separate it, it's hard to separate because of that moisture. When we're talking about pneumothorax, that's exactly what we're talking about. The lung collapses and it's unable to inflate again, okay? So is a bleb always there on every single person or is no. it only people that have? No, okay. it's not. And there's no rhyme or reason why people get blebs. Um, what my first, my first, chest tube I saw inserted was in cardio and we were at the um I was at St. Mary's and the guy was mowing his lawn everything's mowing the lawn and he felt chest pain and he knew because he had these blubs before um so he came in and it was interesting because there was another school there in the ER and she then um nurse had us listen to the lung sounds and I could not hear anything on the right nothing and so when she said, so what'd you hear? And so the other 
the other school, the student goes, oh, I heard just diminished love or diminished lung sounds. And she looked at me and I said, I guess I need another stethoscope because I could not hear anything. And she goes, you're right, you shouldn't because he had a right pneumothorax. So we ended up putting a chest tube. And then he actually was an Aldi customer of mine and I got to put it in his first IV, which whenever he's like, is this your first time doing it? I'm like, no, I lied. But we used to be able to put IVs in each other at school. So we don't do that anymore though. I guess it's some legalities or something. So um, the blebs don't happen to everybody, but you know, even people that have blebs, a lot of times they don't they don't cause them any issues whatsoever anyway. Um, what is some signs and symptoms of a pneumothorax? Chloritic, chest pain, shortness of breath, tachypnea, tachycardia, asymmetrical chest movement, breath sounds over area diminished or absent. Very good. That's exactly it. So what are the three classifications of traumatic pneumothorax? Open, closed, and latrogenic. Okay. So open, you think, uh, what do you think of when you think of open? Bad. Bad? <laughs> yeah, bad, but stab. <laughs> stab. Okay. Stab, gunshot, gun, gunshot, um, any anything that's penetrated the chest wall that's open. Okay, so then what do we think about clothes? Like a car crash. Yeah, that's the easiest way to think. Car crash, um, falling off your horse, anything like that. And then the allergenic is we did it. Put it in a central line. Um, put it in a pacemaker. Something that we did and we nicked the lung and it caused it to collapse. Um, so the man manifestations of a traumatic pneumothorax is basically the same as a regular pneumothorax, right? But if you have an open, you're going to have a... Uh, what we call a sucking chest wound means that every time they breathe, they suck in more um, air into their lung cavity. Um, so what is a tension pneumothorax? Injury to the chest wall that allows air to enter but not escape. Okay, so when we're talking about that, every time you take a breath, you breathe in, in air, it gets into your lungs and it escapes the lung and goes into the thoracic cavity. Okay. So what happens is every time you take a breath, it's not allowed to escape. And it's kind of like, if you look at that goat lung that they did, that is a classic, a great example of what a tension pneumo is. So every time you breathe, you breathe in air, but it's not allowing any air to escape. So what happens? Eventually, there's so much air that it's going to shift. It's going to shift your trachea. It's going to shift your lungs. Or not your lungs, your heart. And when everything's shifted, what's going to happen? But your heart's going to go into heart failure. So then you're going to see the JVD, okay? Shortness of breath. Okay, because of the fact that it's medial sinal shift, it's a medical emergency. So if you have a patient that goes into a tension pneumothorax, we got to get, get a chest tube in as soon as possible to equalize that air. So every time they breathe in, the air will release. Okay, so what would you expect to see in a tension pneumothorax? Well, pain, tachypnea, tachycardic. When you're talking about a regular pneumothorax, maybe the guy had a bleb. If he has a normal pneumothorax, he might be like on 89 on a couple liters of oxygen. Tension pneumo, they're going to be very um, 
their SpO2 is going to be very diminished. So they might be on, you might have them on 10 liters and they'll be at 88%. They're going to have, think of shock. Their blood pressure is going to be decreased because the heart is unable to pump like it should. So we're going to have a decrease in blood pressure, decrease in SpO2, pain, okay, tachypenic, and tachycardic. So it's a medical emergency. If we don't get the, if we don't get that air out, then they're going to go into cardiac arrest. Okay. Are we good on that? Just one person. Okay. Thank you, Jaden, for nodding. And it doesn't matter which side that they have the tension pneumo on, they'll still have that uh the same symptoms. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, so how do we fix an acute pneumothorax? Chest tube? Yeah, chest tube is the way to go. Okay, um, where should the chest tube be kept? So like in relation to the patient? Below the level of the chest? Yes, below the level of the chest. You don't want it above the chest, okay? Do we milk a chest tube? No. No, you know what milking is? It's when you sit there and could because you can have a chest tube for a pneumothorax. Remember, you can have a chest tube because you're having a um you're having surgery. So if you had an open, if you've had a cabbage, um, a thoracotomy, thoracotomy, cabbage, you're gonna be getting fluid off and lymph. So what happens is sometimes that lymph it kind of looks like tissue coming through the chest tube. Um you know, sometimes that could clog it, but we're not allowed to milk it, okay? Um, let's see, what is the difference between a water sealed chest tube and a dry sealed chest tube? Anybody? I feel like saying forest. No, it's not forest. Bueller. Bueller. Nobody. Okay. Did, did anybody watch Ferris Bueller's Day Off? Oh my gosh. Add that to the list. <laughs> oh, you seen it, Alexa? It was just on the other day. Okay. So, what's the difference between a water seal chest tube and a dry seal chest tube? Well, with the water seal chest tube, we're using a suction via water. With a dry seal chest tube, we're using mechanical suction. Okay, so with the water seal, the biggest thing is we have to be careful. We have to keep replacing the water for it to be accurate because it will um, evaporate. So we use sterile water for the water seal chamber and that's for the suction control. With the dry seal chest tube, we will use mechanical. So with the water seal, you don't hook it. It doesn't have to be hooked to suction? No, it does not. Like HS, HS uses um, water seal and SSM, it's kind of funny, SSM uses dry seal. Okay. So what, what exactly is the water doing that's pulling the fluid out or the oh, just pulling it out. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> I mean, and I and I think I've seen really we use dry seal. Um we use but it's just something I'm gonna have to procure a water seal chest tube. I don't even know if we have any. I'm going to bring next Tuesday, I'll bring in um, a chest tube so we can look at it. Okay. And we cannot, it's hard to get it on paper, but if you look at it, you'll be able to understand a little bit better. Um, what do you do if a chest, tu chest tube is pulled out? Put a sterile dressing on it and tape it on three sides. Okay. Why three sides? Anybody? Okay, so let me do this. 
Mm. Okay, you can't see it real good. But if I put it on four sides, right? What happens? You can't really see it, but if I suck on it, air Cut can't out. come in, right? Air can't come in or come out. But if I go on three sides, now you can't see shit. I mean, crap. If I do it on three sides, when I breathe in, the paper will go like this and will cover the cover the um, site, right? When I breathe out, the air that I just, I'm letting out will be able to leave that opening. So when I breathe in, it stops air from coming into the opening, but then when I breathe out, it allows air to release, thus stopping a tension pneumothorax from happening. So if you would sit there and say, pull, you didn't mean to, but you pulled out a chest tube, what could happen is the patient can go in a tension pneumo because the air is allowed to come in, but it's not allowed to leave. If you put it on three sides, it will allow the air, when you breathe in, it will, it will cover that um, site. But when you breathe out, it will allow the um, air to leave. Does that make sense? I'm trying to think so of- So it's not coming in, it's just going out or it is right. coming in and out? No, it's a, it's only going out. Okay. Because just think like of- Like a vent, kind of like a vent. Like what? Like a vent? Yeah, like a vent. When it comes in, it sucks in and it covers that site so no air can come in when they breathe in. Think about your mask. Just uh, your regular surgical mask. If you breathe in, that that air comes into your, your mask can actually cover your mouth, right? If you take a nice deep breath. But when you release, what happens? The air is allowed to leave. And that's a lot of times what the, th that's what, a th why we do it for three way, only three sides, is we allow that air to leave, okay? Thus, keeping the patient stable until we can put another chest tube in. Do you guys understand that? Like I said, it will, we can, we, when I bring in the chest tube next Tuesday, it will be a little bit easier to understand. Um, what do you do if the patient becomes tach, tach, tachypneic, tachycardic, and with chest pain? For that last question, are we contacting the doctor immediately? Oh yeah, you're gonna hit an RRT. Cause they'll ha I mean, they have to fix it like immediately, right? Yeah, yeah. And let me, now that you put that in. So if you pull it out, the chest tube is so into the, the patient. It's usually really, really tight. Um, if you t yank that out, if you yank that chest tube out, the patient A is gonna scream cause it hurts. But we put that three side in. If you would take it apart from the atrium and say you have the, the chest tube, like the hose um, coming out, what we're going to do is we're going to put a, we can put the hose in actually a normal saline. And maybe that's getting a little bit too deep. Um, if you put it in nor um, sterile water, normal saline, sterile water, you're allowing the air to come out, but not letting the air come back in. And I have a perfect video for you guys to see that on. And we will watch it. I might even pop some popcorn because it's an excellent video how to show that, how a chest tube really works. Okay. So trust me on this. We'll, we'll revisit this. Okay. Um, is changing the chest tube dressing sterile or clean? Sterile. sterile. Yes, definitely sterols, we can get it. Um, if it, oh, let me go back to 34. If a patient is tachypenic, tachycardic, or chest pain, we're gonna look to see if the patient is like on any, if they're laying on their chest, uh, on their tubing, um, if it's kinked in any way. It's what's happening is that the air is not allowed, is not able to leave. Um, what should be kept at the bedside of a patient with a chest tube? 
dressings applies in hemostats. Right, hemostats, and we want occlusive dressings. Okay. Who can measure the drainage of a chest tube? A nurse. A nurse? Can a CNA do it? No. Technically, they can because they, they measure urine, right? Yeah. So technically, they can. Um, per facility, though, like as SSM, we the nurses have to measure it. But it's, I mean, it's well in their way. And the way they would measure it is they would measure it and you put a line with the permanent marker and the date, and that's how much you measure it by. Okay, but you have to do a permanent marker. Don't do a dry away raise because that's going to screw everything up. Um, what is titling? The movement of the water in the water seal chamber. Okay, so why does that happen? Because there's air escaping. Right. So if your patient is has a pneumothorax, we would expect titling, meaning that the water goes up and down. So when they breathe, it goes up and then goes back down. When the patient's pneumothorax is resolved, we should not see any more titling. Okay. Um, bubbling is another way we can see if there's air coming in and out of the patient. If there's an air leak, we'll see bubbles, okay? But we'll talk more about that. I think chest tubes for me was the scariest thing walking on the floor. Because A, my big feet, I was afraid I was gonna knock them over. Um, and B, oh my God, it's a garden hose in the size of a person's chest. So we'll see how much time we have tomorrow, if we can go over to chest tubes tomorrow, but I'm thinking probably next Tuesday we'll go over the chest tubes. Um, how do you know if the chest tube has a leak? Well, we're going to see some bubbling, okay? And it's more like, a, it reminds me more of a aquarium bubbling, okay? Um, where you'll see, you know, rapid bubbling. Um, if a patient has, if it, so let me go back. If a patient has an air leak in their line, if they are tachypenic, tachycardic, and are having a hard time breathing, we're going to call rapid response because there's an air leak, okay? The patient is unstable. If they have a, a small air leak and they are comfortable, as much as comfortable as you can be having a garden hose in your chest, um, they're not tachypenic or tachycardic, what we're gonna do is we're going to just watch it and monitor it. Um, Veronica had a patient last week um, that got a chest tube. And I still don't think that, I think Stacy was wrong when she said that he had an air leak because I did not see an air leak in that patient. And he was comfortable, comfortable other than the fact that he has uh, a garden hose in his chest. Um, but if it's an air leak and they're tachypenic, tachycardic, we're going to get people there to figure out where this air leak is and to stop it. Um, when, a pa when we take a chest tube out, we will have the patient, we don't do it, a nurse practitioner or a doctor does it, we have the patient bear down and we put an occlusive dressing on that site. Okay, when we put the occlusive dressing on that site, um, we will tape it, you know, all four sides. The, the pneumo thorax is healed, so we don't have to do all the three sides. Okay, we do an inclusive dressing on that, that site. Okay. Becky, so do you see anything else besides bubbling or is that it that like notifies you? The bubbling, so it'd be kind of like the walking in, you see the patient tachypenic and tachycardic. Um, then we look and they, we can see that there is bubbling and we know that there's an air leak. There's ways that we can find it we can use our hemostats and go from the atrium on down 
Um, but it really depends on how the patient's doing. Okay, if we're gonna if we're gonna find a leak or we call some, you know, call for reinforcements um, for that leak. So is this more so with the Naomi, please be quiet. Is this more so with the dry seal, the dry seal um chest tubes or water? It can be both. It can be both. With the bubbling. It can be so both. So to so with the dry seal, it's gonna title. But with is it a constant bubbling with the wet seal? I'm trying to differentiate which okay. one is which. So with the titling, the titling you'll see in both of them. And you know when a patient breathes in and breathes out that they, they should have titling. Or if they cough, you should see some titling. And that should be on both of them. Okay, it's expected with a pneumothorax. When we don't see any titling anymore we can expect that that patient, the pneumothorax is hot, is healed. If you have titling and a patient is get is there because of surgery, so we're getting fluid off their chest, they should not have titling. Does that help? So if the bubbling is happening, that's showing that there's, there's flu, there's air coming from um, the patient. So if they are there because of a cabbage, then they really shouldn't have any bubbling whatsoever, unless it's an air leak. And they should not have titling. Okay. I just had it written down bubbling and wet seal chamber means it's working. So that means that it's an air leak. Right. You can okay. have a little bit of bubble, like a bubble here, a bubble there. But if it's a constant bubbling, a vigorous bubbling, then it's an air leak. But let's let's talk in depth with this when you we have the chest tube in front of us. So maybe I'll do bring it out tomorrow. Let me see. Because it's to me, it's just so hard to to fathom without having it in front of you, three D or 40, whatever it is, in reality. I have a quick question, kind of off subject. You keep talking about next Tuesday. I thought after Thanksgiving, we didn't come back to class. Oh, Am I wrong yeah. on that? So, hey, it's the end of the semester. My filter is gone, okay? So I will have to break out the chest tube tomorrow. Because, yeah, I was considering, yeah, I'll see you next Tuesday. Not so much. So I apologize. Thanks for bringing that to my attention that I'm an idiot. I forgot about that. Okay. Tomorrow we'll bring out the chest tubes. Okay. Um, what is a foot? Oh, what are signs and symptoms of a rib fracture? Pain on inspiration, coughing, shallow respirations, crepitus, and atelectasis. What is um, crepitus? It looks like Rice Krispies underneath the skin. Yeah, that's exactly it. So subcutaneous air, it gets right underneath the skin and it kind of looks like Rice Krispies. It feels kind of cool. So is it just like air pockets? Yeah. Like, can you can you push on it and it'll go away? Or how does no. that work? No, it's no. like Rice Krispies. It's kind of hard. Or like... Um, but eventually the skin will absorb that air and it will go away. Okay, what is a flail chest? Multiple rib fractures impaired chest wall stability. Okay, so what happens with the what happens with the chest? Like uh, what are well, what are some manifestations of a flail chest? Dyspnea, pain, unequal chest expansion, palpable crepitus, and diminished breath sounds. Yeah, it's painful as heck. So what do you think one of our first interventions is going to be? Pain management. Before pain management. Maintain an airway. Yeah, we want to make pain an airway. Okay. And we're probably going to get them to surgery because if they have multiple chest um, rib fractures, they're probably um, going to need to be stabilized. 
Okay, when it calls that flail chest, that means it 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 there is no rhyme or reason when the chest wall um you know you're gonna have like this going on. Okay, it's very unstable. Okay, what does pulmonary paradoxical movement mean? Paradoxical movement. Yeah. Yeah. What's pulmonary fibrosis? Yeah, scarring, scarring of the lung. Yeah, so the lung's not able to expand like it normally would, right? Um, what do you think the diagnosis for these folks are? Or prognosis? Not so good, it doesn't get better. It's not very good at all. We had a gentleman two years ago, he left, and I want to say he was on 25 liters of oxygen when he left. And you guys that work in long-term care, can you can your facility handle 25 liters of oxygen? I mean, usually it's like five liters. So even getting him to a long-term facility was very difficult. Um, so the prognosis for pulmonary fibrosis is not good. What about sarcoidosis? Chronic multi-system granulomatous disease, also involving skin, eyes, liver, kidney, heart, and lymph nodes. Yeah, generally what we do is they do a, um, they do, they come in for different things. And I would consider it almost an autoimmune, but what happens is they take um, an x-ray and that's usually how we start looking into that. Okay, what about, a, what is a PE? The pulmonary embolism of blood clot in the lungs. Okay, blood clot. Can it be anything other than a blood clot? Yes. What could it be? Um, like the tip of a cath lawn from an IV. Yeah. It could be air, right? An air embolus that we didn't we didn't prime our tubing right, so they got a whole ten milliliters of air. It could be amniotic. It could be pus. It could be a number of things. Um, what are some risk factors for a PE? Prolonged immobility, trauma, surgery, MIs, oral contraceptives, estrogen therapy, obesity. This is very simple, similar to a DVT, right? So we've been there, done that, right? Um, what peripheral vascular disease could cause a PE? You guys know this. The, um, what was that? You said which one can cause a PE? Yeah. Would it be PAD? I said DVT, but I wasn't sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, so a DVT causes PE, right? So what vascular disease would cause a DVT? Coronary artery disease? I don't know. No, not artery. It would be vascular. Oh, PB. what kind of vascular? What was that, Chastity? PVD. Yes, PVD. Remember? Because what happens, the blood isn't able to get back to the heart. So it kind of pulls and coagulates into the into the limbs, the feet, the legs. So a DVT. So whenever you're talking about PEs, you're talking about DVTs and a peripheral vascular disease that could be, what was the complication, would be um, peripheral venous. So we're talking about venous. Um, what are some manifestations of a PE? Shortness. 
shortness of breath, um, tachypnea, tachycardia. Pain, chest pain, right? Anxiety, crackles, low grade fever, diaphoresis. Yeah. Guys, you don't, when somebody can't breathe, you will see that gloom doom on their face. Okay. Um, what is a fat emboli? It's whenever fat from a long bone travels to the lungs. Okay, from a long bone. So is it a break or is it a, uh, is it a break or is it a, I'm trying to think of the word. It occurs after fractures. Yes, it is a fracture. So what are signs and symptoms of a fat emboli? Petechiae over the chest and arms. Yes. And then basically the same thing as a, as um, a PE, but the petechiae is particular. Okay. Who's at risk? Well, we talk about who's at risk. So anybody that did a long bone, usually what we're talking about is the uh, femur. So possibly um, a hip, right? Because we're talking about that nice bone marrow inside. Um, how do we diagnose an emboli? So a PE. Plasma D-dimer, CT with contrast, pulmonary yeah. angiography. And this is if it's like, if you walk into a room and the person, you feel that the person developed a PE, we're not gonna like, we're gonna treat it as a PE and then we're gonna do the D-dimer. You know, cause a D-dimer is usually if somebody's having chest pain, but they're still stable, we'll do a D-dimer. But if a patient's not stable, we're gonna treat it as a PE first and then we'll get all of our data to collect it. Um, so how are we gonna treat an emboli, a PE? Anticoagulants. Right, go back, yeah, go back to your AFib and your DVTs. Heparin, Coumadin, Eliquis, we're, gonna, we're going to stop them from getting a DVT. Remember DVT, PE, okay? Um, how are we gonna prevent an emboli? Early ambulation, compression stockings, prophylactic anticoagulants after surgeries, risk education. That's it. That's definitely it. Okay. So, like I said, we've been there, done that with P, uh, DVTs and with the prophylaxis and everything like that. So what is pulmonary hypertension? Abnormal elevation of pulmonary arterial pressure. Okay. And it kind of scars it and gets, and so we lose our vascular um, bed, so to speak, um, in the lungs. And that's what really causes a pulmonary hypertension. What is the manifestations of pulmonary hypertension? Progressive dyspnea, fatigue, angina, syncope with exertion. Okay. And what's the prognosis with patients with pulmonary hypertension? It's usually very small, like maybe three years, four years. And of course, it depends on how advanced their disease process is. Okay, that's for the primary. You can also have secondary. In secondary, you have a little bit better chance, but primary pulmonary hypertension is not very good. What is core pulmonale? Condition of the right ventricular hypertrophy and failure that results from long-standing pulmonary hypertension. Yeah. So how are we going to treat that? What do you all think? Calcium channel blockers, vasodilators. So we're going to treat it a lot like heart failure, aren't we? In a way, we're going to treat it like heart failure. Okay. Oh, we're almost done, guys. I know you're excited. Don't jump up and down. Okay, don't even smile. Oh, thank you, Emily. Emily's jumping up and down. 
Um, oh, I don't know why I said, how is Cora Pulmonell? I don't even know what I meant with that. How uh, do we diagnose it? Oh, okay. How do we diagnose it? ABGs, O2 SAT measurements. Yeah. CBC. CBC, definitely. Um, and it's generally the disease process. Like somebody doesn't come in and say, oh, I have core pulmonale. Basically they have the pulmonary hypertension and it goes into core pulmonale. It's a complication. What medications are we used to treat pulmonary vasoconstriction? Calcium channel blockers, vasodilators, yep. soldenafil, yeah. coumadin. Okay, and then how do we slow the course of the disease? Salt and water restrictions and diuretics. Yeah, so basically it's we're treating it almost like lung failure or heart failure, huh? In a way, we are. Okay, so tomorrow I will pull out the, um, the chest tube so you can see the chest tube and know what it looks like and what it feels like and what like really be able to see it okay any questions i have a question about like the finals and stuff so if we're having the finals in person why aren't we going back next week i don't know okay. i put i put part of my so i would like to go back but i put a part of the final so you're going to have to do something. Okay, so if we, we were allowed to do the final in person, if we put a clinical element to it. So as part of the final, and I'll get more into it tomorrow, but part of the final will be listening to breath sounds or looking at an EKG machine and, um, tell me what, you know, what rhythm it is. But other than that, if it does not, it, if it, your final is not attached to any kind of um, like skill testing, then we're not allowed to be on campus. But since I have part of my, part of it skill testing, it's not hard. So you'll have to look at the um, EKG machine, which you'll have practice with tomorrow to see if it's AFib or VTAC or something like that. So it's basically a strip, but it's a running strip. Or you'll have to listen to lungs and it's not gonna be anything wacky like, you know, uh, bronchi versus, um, you know, coarse crackles or anything. It might be a um, expiratory wheeze. So you might hear wheezing or you might hear crackles, but it's something, it's, a, it's, it's something just to, um, have you listen and diagnose. Okay. I would prefer you guys being in class because that way I could show my chest tube next week. Like I've been planning in my head for the last hour, but Bro, will this sorry to burst your bubble. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> will this be on paper? Will our final be on paper or will we have to do it on the it's computer? On paper. It's old okay. fashioned fill in the dots. Okay. okay. And will we have more questions than 60 or will it still be 60 points it's since you 60? Cool. Okay. okay. So it's all the same, but it's just going to be on paper. Will you let like us that are stuck at home know like how to study for like the EKG strip since we're not going to be there tomorrow to do any of it? So I would study, you know, that um, there, I think I have EKG practice where um, way back in like week one, where it's the running EKG strip. I mean, just that's basically what's going to be. Um, okay. And then they have, and I'll put up websites um, so you know what to listen for, like crackles versus expiratory wheezes, that kind of stuff. And really, I'm not even going to distinguish between expiratory wheezes and inspiratory. It's just going to be wheezes. Okay. Okay. And then will you do the chest, like show the chest tube on Zoom tomorrow just so I can see it virtual, I guess? Yeah, I can do that. Okay. I can do that. So since you were thinking, 
sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Since you were thinking that we were going to be in class on Tuesday, is anything expected of us next Tuesday? Because I have my farm final that day, so I'm just wondering. Next Tuesday is your farm final? I think so. The eighth. Am I off? No. After. Okay. So then, never mind. Okay. So, Amber, you're back on the what? When are you back? The first. Yeah, it's the 14 days from contact. Okay. So the first. We can look at the chest tubes in clinical also. Okay, when I come, whenever that makeup day is. Yeah. Okay. Well, actually, be before because you're that clinical. My last clinical day was technically November thirtieth. Oh, that sucks. Yeah, and I can't come back till Tuesday. Right. Oh, this damn COVID. Yeah, she told me even if I tested negative, I could test negative multiple times and they still wouldn't accept it. I have to have 14 days out from exposure. Yeah, because they're having um, a lot of false negatives. A lot of- Did right you talk to Julie about whenever that makeup day is gonna be? Well- That like Sunday that talked about? Well, considering it just affected another three people did it this week. I'll be, she'll be there tomorrow. We can talk to her then. Um, I can imagine it's going to be before the, it, maybe that Thursday. I'll find out tomorrow. I'll talk to her tomorrow. Because I did extend your Epic, like whenever I did your Epic, it, we have until December 18th. Um, for you, at December 18th, you will no longer have Epic access for the semester. So it has to be. Wait, so will we have to be going to the hospital or is this a sim day like at no, the school? we'll be at the hospital. Oh. It would be hard to press to do a 12 hour clinical or a 12 hour sim. I, that would be just exhausting. Um, so we're going to be doing, it's going to be at the hospital. We just don't, we don't know if we're going to be combining groups or like all third semester will go together and all second semester, it all depends on how many people have to make it up is what we're looking at. Um, hopefully, well, like today, we only had two patients on 3,200 that we could take. So two, of, two students went upstairs to 3,200. I guess they had a good time on 3,200. Um, we had one downstairs in ICU, which they had vented patients, but they only had two patients that weren't COVID downstairs too. So, and then the, one of our patients was being, oh, he was a STEMI. So he was a good patient, um, but typically boring because we fixed him at 2.30 in the morning. So but the other one was a good patient. That- <laughs> Hi, huh, Jaden. Is Jaden still on here? As he's telling us, I'm not going to make it home. I'm not going to see my home again. I felt so bad. We're like, we'll get you there one way or the other. Okay. Does that answer your questions? Yeah. I have one question about clinical though. Last question. <laughs> so I'm looking at the schedule and it says that the Wednesday, your Wednesday group has clinical on the 2nd. And yes. then the seventh, which is a Monday. Yes. Is that, so are we combining clinical or is that Monday group going to be finished? The Monday group is going to be done. You guys had two weeks off, two weeks off. Okay. Veterans Day and then you have this Wednesday off. So I had to throw you in there somewhere. And I, okay. I personally like Mondays better than Saturdays. I agree. <laughs> That's just me. So that's why it's on a, on that Monday. Yeah. Okay, are we good? I'd rather have not have two 12 hour clinicals in one week. Well, it's not. <laughs> One's the seventh. No, I'm just no, I'm saying that's why I would prefer Monday. Oh. Than Saturday. And we did that before is to have them two in a week. Actually, I have a question too. What was that? Um we talked after clinical last week about the presentation, the PowerPoint presentation we have to do. Yeah. Did I miss where you posted something about it? No, I've just been, I should have done it today. 
So let me, get, I was just curious if I let me get some dinner and then <laughs> I will do, I'll try to put a robot up. Thank you. No problem. Did we even ask about the quiz from last week? <laughs> the, you know what? The report isn't up. I'll show you that report isn't up. And so for me to go through and see, I would have to go, I was really hoping. I'm hoping that you guys ace the quiz tomorrow so I don't even have to worry about it at this point in time. Because to look at the quiz, I have to go through every one of you and every one and mark which ones you got wrong. And that will take me hours. There's 26 of you. Just give the same quiz and we'll all ace it. Actually, I like this quiz better. So those that are going to be at home, you can take it virtually. Those will, those other, everybody else will be taking it paper. And I think you're going to like the quiz a lot. 20 better. questions again or 10 questions? 10. 10. I don't have enough time to, for you guys to take 20 questions. Okay. So it's 10 questions. And I think you're going to find you like these questions a lot easier, not easier. You're just going to like these a lot more. Okay. So if Alexa, if you guys don't do well tomorrow, then I will take the time and go through and mark. Because I don't have a spreadsheet that I can sit there and go, everybody missed this one. Everybody has that missed that one. I'd have to go through everybody. And I, I was not looking forward to that at all. The report should have been up. It's usually up within 24 hours and it's not. So. Maybe that's just a sign that everybody's going to get 100 on the test tomorrow. Maybe. Hopefully. Is this one exception that you were <laughs> Oh, you're breaking up on me. What's that? Is this the one exception you want everybody to get 100 on the quiz? Yes, please do, so I don't have to go through that other quiz. OK. Sound good? Becky, when do you want our, my, me and like Christine's case that he's done by? Before the final would be nice. Oh, okay. Sound good? Yeah, because I've been sleeping, so. How are you feeling? I don't feel, it comes and it goes, but I haven't tested positive, but my neck hurts the worst. Like I take um, medicine whenever I'm due and I'm okay. But then I get like this terrible headache. So I call Christine and I asked Christine, I said, how did your start? She's like, with a headache in my neck, how's your headache? And I was like, she's like, where's that? I'm like, in my neck. She's like, oh, so I don't know. That's I don't feel awful and I can still taste, but Christine has lost her sense of taste and smell. It's done. <laughs> <laughs> she said she felt good up and like she sounded good this morning when I talked to her and then this afternoon she says Amber I don't feel good anymore I'm like no I didn't think you did so yeah it sucks but I just went and got tested today so I will find out probably the end of the week probably at this rate yeah a lot of places aren't doing the rapids anymore because they've had so many false negatives so I didn't I didn't want my work to use a wrap it on me since I'm not working like it was pointless for them to waste it right well that was nice of you right and I'm just I mean if I'm gonna be sick I'm gonna be sick it really doesn't matter if it comes back positive or negative if I don't feel good I don't feel good right that's true too well well I hope you guys feel better well thank you okay you guys good okay I shall see you tomorrow with bells on. Okay, maybe not. Should I come early to take that other quiz or you want me to stay after? You might have time in between everything. Okay. It's up to you. And it is over the infectious valve. I don't want to tell yeah. you the wrong stuff. Yep, okay. that's it. Okay. okay, see you guys. Hopefully I'll be able to do this. Come